The Prime Minister's Independence Day speech marks a seminal moment in his three months in office. There's no doubt he's captured the imagination of the country and captivated the media. But he's also raised interesting questions about his political style as well as his political thinking. With me to discuss those issues is one of India's foremost political thinkers, Harvard Professor Prathab Bhanu Mehta. Dr. Mehta, writing in the Indian Express on Saturday, you compared Narendra Modi to the former French President Charles de Gaulle, who you said was in his time once described as a Republican monarch. What exactly is the point you're making? Uh, well, that comparison was meant to be suggestive, not, not, not literal. But I think two things are very important. One, that here is somebody who claims to personify the power of the people in him directly without the mediation of any other uh, kind of institutions. And second, I think um, the enormous centralization of power. So it's a form of kind of democratic centralism uh, that Mr. Modi represents that seems to suggest something akin to kind of de Gaulle's sort of slightly right of center authoritarianism. It's very interesting that you say both de Gaulle and Modi personify the people in themselves. And in fact, you write in your article, Modi has the unique ability to wield authority and yet personify the people. Is there a danger that at some point Narendra Modi could become a powerful demagogue? Whenever there is that degree of concentration of power, there is always a danger. And I think in Mr. Modi's case in particular, um, you know, his great achievement in a sense has, to, has been to create his own power from nothing, literally. Uh, but uh, the danger of that is that all the other intermediating institutions, including his own party, by the way, uh, actually will be so weakened in comparison to his own authority that that, that, that danger is, is, is always there and we have to be vigilant about it. He has to be vigilant about it. In fact, what you're saying, the bigger Mr. Modi right. becomes as a personality right. and as the dominant prime minister, right. Right. the greater this danger of demagoguery as well. Uh, absolutely. Well, there are two dangers. There's the danger of dem demagoguery and, and then there's the danger that you, in a sense, hear your own voice uh, you, you you know you can get trapped in an echo chamber very easily and begin uh, to believe your and, own and, words. and begin to believe that your own words are actually translating to action into the ground when they're not so there's a real sense in which you're forewarning yes. the country about this possible danger yes this is a warning and not a, not a description as yet <laughs> now in fact you also make this point in your article in the Indian Express that Charles de Gaulle could be authoritarian, at times he could even be dictatorial. You say that in fact he often treated his cabinet colleagues as school children. Cabinet mm. meetings were not discussions amongst equals, they were actually ministerial reports mm. to someone who was acknowledged quite clearly as a superior. Is that another danger in the Modi case? Uh, that seems to be, I mean, from all the reports one's getting, it doesn't seem to be a cabinet that's prone to very free and open discussion and you often get the sense that people are scared when they're speaking to him uh, how far this is true remains to be seen but 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 certainly i think that's the reputation the government is acquiring and this is another warning that you're sounding it, it is it, it is a warning and it's meant in a constructive way now in the context of that warning and in the context of what you said that mr modi compares in some sense with charles de gaulle let's come to how you view the actual content of mr modi his speech from the ramparts of the Red Fort. You say that, in fact, the most convincing part of the speech was when Mr. Modi spoke about social issues. You say he addressed unpalatable truths with rare political directness, conviction, and lack of embarrassment. In a sense, the point you're making is that only Mr. Modi could have done this. No other politician could have done it. Only Mr. Modi could have done it for, I think, two reasons. One, because, as I said, he, he, I think, claims a mandate directly from the people. His authority is not dependent on anybody else. He can claim to be one of them. Second, I think we have to accept the fact that he does represent a major shakeup of the Indian power structure. Almost any other politician saying it. Jamra and Ramesh, for instance, tried to say, you know, uh, toilets, not temples. There is always this kind of hint of upper class condescension that it always carried. And other, in a sense, uh, uh, politicians have emerged from backward caste groups. I think they were so keen on pointing out to the fact that they wanted to escape from that condition, uh, that it was very difficult for them artic to articulate a truth that all of us know to be the truth. But because Mr. Modi is so obviously of the people, he can say this without patronization he, and condescension, he, he, and he has no embarrassment saying it either. He, he's both of the people, and he also represents a new form of social mobility. In, 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 you know, in, in some ways, he, he doesn't have that kind of aristocratic veneer about him. The negative side of this is the possibility he could become a demagogue. The positive side is it gives him unique power to address social issues 
others didn't have absolutely i mean he has the kind of legitimacy at the moment which almost no prime minister in the last 25 30 years has had and it's a it's a wonderful opportunity for him let me put to you the sort of response someone like kapil sibal gave me on the weekend mm. he said that whilst mr modi's comments about rape cleanliness the need for bathrooms yeah. the skewed sex ratio were admirable and very welcome they were insufficient and because they were insufficient he said they were just sound bites he said to be effective and meaningful right. the prime minister would have to launch a social movement would you agree i mean i mean i agree that the words by in and of themselves are not not sufficient but i think what is remarkable is the fact that he raised this issue to a central a uh, tenant of political faith i mean the idea that this is the most important challenge that our biggest failures are not state failures market failures but they are social failures particularly on gender particularly on cleanliness particularly on sanitation to give it this kind of political visibility itself is a good start that is the first point in a social revolution right you know it's very interesting the way you characterize right. the social issues that mr modi right. raised you said each of these are examples right. of social failures right. and the question that comes to my mind is this can any prime minister no matter how truly he is of the people as clearly yes, mr modi yes, is yes, of the yes, people yes, yes, yes. but can even mr modi change society break down long ingrained habits simply by admonishing and chiding people because that's all he was doing at the moment well i mean i mean you know the, given the kind of platform the 15th august speech is that's all he could do Uh, I think on the sanitation side, very frankly, he has set some very, very clear targets and goals, and and also put 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 in place an in institutional scaffolding that just might actually work. But on issues like gender and so forth, he was telling us very clearly that it has to be all of us uh, uh, putting our energies behind this kind of social transformation. At the moment, on issues like cleanliness and rape, on the way we bring up our children and the responsibility we have to as parents take if our sons become rapists, on all those issues. Mr Modi was cajoling right. admonishing chiding right. his challenge is to find a way of going beyond it to ensure that his chiding actually produces an outcome absolutely and 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 it's challenge and and so long as he remains credible his task will be easier uh, the minute the government loses credibility even the chiding and cajoling will stop working and therefore his credibility is absolutely intrinsic to whatever success he can hope for in terms of changing social attitudes right uh, absolutely and, and he has to begin by saying that look i i'll transform government i will do my job Uh, uh which will then give people confidence that uh their energies will not go in vain let's then come to in fact how he transforms government because if you paid attention to the political aspects and uh, elements of mr modi's right, speech right. there was a very strong plea for political reconciliation right. he praised previous governments he said he wanted to rule by consensus not by majority and once again the opposition turned around and said these are pretty mm. sounding words these are just sound bites mm. because the sad fact is mr modi's actions mm. often don't don't match up to his sentiments would you say that for instance the fact that the leader of opposition matter is still not resolved and the whole budget session is over and it remains unresolved right. in a sense proves the opposition skepticism to be correct well i mean i think mr modi does talk at a very high level of abstraction whenever he talks about reconciliation uh look le le let's be very clear P politics is a game of hard knocks and nobody gives power away willingly i think we have to be clear that and the opposition has to find ways of creating its own own power it's not going to be given to if it goes around begging for it uh my concern i think on the on the abstraction with which he talks about conciliation is actually on the communalism issue i think that's a far more serious issue where he gave even eloquent uh, plea to rise about dif above differences of identity a moratorium on violence but frankly the institutional actions of his own party are not matching up to his own call and i think that is a bigger cause for worry if i that element of skepticism echoes very strongly in the article you wrote for the indian express talking about mr modi's plea for communal harmony brotherliness and togetherness you say how does a communalism free india translate in the killing fields of uttar pradesh or the hallowed chambers of parliament where the prime minister's colleagues have certainly added fuel to fire you're actually suggesting that there are many instances where when mr modi talks about communal harmony either his actions or sometimes his lack of action shows that perhaps there's a big gap he needs to fill and that gap is one of credibility the most effective action he needs to take is to stop the unruly elements in his own party 
uh, derailing uh, what he claims to be his, uh, his agenda. Uh, UP is very fragile and the conduct of BJP politicians is not helping. The choice of Adityanath as a main speaker in a debate on communalism uh, did not send the right signal. Uh, these are things that are under his control. There's no excuse. And he has to exercise moder moral, moral leadership uh, in his own party in a very effective way to be credible outside. But in fact, these are all instances where he could have acted and didn't act. And therefore, this is not something that was a lapse. It right. was a conscious decision. Right. Fielding Yogi Adityanath right. was a conscious decision. Right not speaking out right. when there have been communal incidents right. and maintaining silence right. was a conscious decision. Right. Not reigning in the VHP right. or the RSS or the Bajrang Dal or elements of the RSS who are campaigning in UP and creating discord, right. again, is a conscious decision. So these are decisions he's taking consciously. Well, there seem to be, or, 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 or certainly he's not paying attention, but, 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 but whatever, he, he does bear responsibility uh, uh, for these decisions. Uh, and, 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 and if he doesn't change course, these are going to come back and haunt him. You're saying something very important. You're also saying that being Prime Minister of India is not just a question of giving the nation political leadership. At critical moments, Mr. Modi has to give moral leadership. He has to come up with an appropriate response on issues of communal or caste violence which disturb the country and around which we can all as a people rally. That moral leadership is still missing. That moral, that moral leadership, and, and I would say institutional leadership, because moral leadership in India can often only mean empty words. That institutional leadership is still missing. And is it missing because if he were to exercise it, right. he would be seen to be doing so against elements of his party, against elements of the RSS, and that may be politically costly or at least personally embarrassing. Well, I'm not sure it's personally embarrassing given the kind of mandate it is. I mean, I think the cynical view would be that, uh, you know, they are actually playing uh, uh, a certain kind of politics in UP um, and, 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 and they hope to capture power in UP with this kind of politics. And if that is the game they are playing, it's going to be indeed a very dangerous game. But if it's not politically embarrassing or personally embarrassing, then why isn't Mr. Modi rising to the occasion? Because clearly he wants to be a successful prime minister. He must know that his silence is raising questions about him, why then is he silent? Well, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to know what he, re what, you know, what, what he really thinks, but, 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 but I think sometimes it does happen to people in power that they don't realize the significance of their own omissions. They become complacent. I mean, I think the analogy is uh, Congress Party in Andhra Pradesh. Right, where they got complacent even, they did, even though, though they knew the potential of uh, how much Andhra politics could destabilize the country. And I think UP is in the same position. You're saying a very important thing. You're saying Mr. Modi needs at some point in time to sit back mm -hmm. and reflect upon his three months as Prime Minister and say to himself, there are moments when I've been silent and I shouldn't have been. I need to learn the lesson from that in future at such moments. I must speak out. I must be seen to give some guidance and leadership. And, and that is what he promised the country. In fact, one of, the re, you know, one of his USBs was supposed to be that he would actually not abdicate and let things pass by through sins of omission. And now there's a hint right. that by being dilatory, right. he's abdicating. Ab absolutely. On, on this particular issue, at least. There is, in fact, in that article you wrote for the Indian Express, also a clear warning that you give Mr. Modi. You write, when you incarnate the people in you, it gives tremendous power and confidence. De Gaulle thought that he would make France new simply because of the fact he was new. Modi should not make the same mistake. Is there a danger that Modi could be making that mistake? I think there is a danger that in, 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 in two ways. One, not recognizing a how much transformation his own party requires uh, uh, to, to carry it along in the direction that he at least hints it in all these wonderful grand, uh, grand, you know, grand speeches. Second, my own sense is that I think he understands some of the hardware of building the nation, infrastructure and so forth, but how do you actually put in place the institutional software that will actually realize the vision that he promises us? He seems to be a little bit at sea on those kinds of issues. To conclude this particular bit of the interview, there's a very interesting conclusion we seem to be approaching, which is that Mr. Modi's tremendous and well-deserved success as Prime Minister when he delivered that impressive speech from the ramparts of the Red Fort has drawn attention to his strengths, but it's also drawn attention to certain weaknesses or certain failures on his part. His success itself has highlighted those weaknesses. 
it, it's it, no, it, exactly. I mean, I mean, you know, when the great communicator does not communicate on the big moral issues, uh, there is obviously a paradox there that needs to be resolved. And in a sense, that paradox right. is created by the success of his speech. Of, yeah, abs ab you know, ab ab absolutely. Let's come to what, for many, was the most striking announcement made in that speech: the abolition of the Planning Commission. Do you believe that, in fact, it's outlived its utility, or do you think Mr. Modi has been a shade hasty? Well, I mean, I think he did need to send a very strong symbolic message that he intends to do things differently. And the Planning Commission had become, in a sense, the classic symbol of an old way of doing things, of an ancient regime, of an old economy. So, to, you know, to, to, to that extent, getting rid of it is not a bad I idea. I think the real test is going to be what is he going to put in its place? Um, uh, who will do the various functions that the Planning Commission uh, uh, performed that still needed to be done, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, some form of interstate transfers, at least the, one that, the ones that went through uh, Planning Commission. Um, frankly, he was a little bit at sea on that. His description of what this new proposed commission would do had so many incompatible elements in it that it was hard to figure out exactly what he had in mind. Should Mr. Modi have waited yes. till he had a clearer idea of what would replace the Planning Commission before he decided to abolish it? Well, look, I, I mean, I think, you know, po po politicians often kind of judge the moment, and, and 15th August was not a bad moment at which to say, I'm planning to do something new, uh, but we hope that the details will follow sooner rather than later. All right. Now, Mr. Modi laid a lot of stress in his speech on Independence Day on manufacturing. Right. It's encapsulated by that very clever phrase, come make in India, and then sell anywhere in the world. Right. But the truth is that manufacturing will not grow. Right unless you have far-reaching radical reforms in areas like, for example, labor law or land acquisition. And although the government has done a certain amount of talking, we don't have a clear roadmap of its thinking in terms of radical reforms that will boost manufacturing. So would you say that this promise of manufacturing is really at this moment a soundbite rather than convincing reorientation of economic policy? Um, it is more soundbite in, in, in two respects. One, I think, to be fair to government, I think what manufacturing will require is actually hundreds of little things to be transformed, not just one or two big bang uh, reforms. You could even have labor reforms. Um, uh, but uh, if the surrounding circumstances in which those labor reforms take place are not propitious, they will not have the desired effect. And I think they are beginning to move. I think the Commerce Ministry has moved an interesting note on the ease of doing business. Um, my worry about their manufacturing policy is I, I think there's still far too much stress on things like special economic zones and these so-called smart cities. Uh, as if you can create these islands and enclaves that can bypass the general misgovernance that holds back our manufacturing. I also don't think they quite yet understand how education is going to fit into this, uh, 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 this puzzle. Uh, so they have taken some steps in the right direction, but the overall picture is not clear. Would I be right in extrapolating from your answer the following? That clearly Mr. Modi has a finely developed intention about what he wants to do to manufacturing, but the policies that will lead there are either not clear and at times maybe even a bit confused. So there's confusion in the policy even if the intention is clear. The, the, and the, there is certainly confusion, con, con, not, not just confusion in Solzhenko, I'll go one step further. I think, I think they're in the danger of repeating the same mistakes that previous governments have made in relation to manufacturing. And I think special economic zones are one instance of that. Is this an instance where Mr. Modi needs a good think tank to sit beside him and to advise him on policy and to clear out the cobwebs in his thinking so that the intention is matched with equally clear, decisive policy? I think he needs a few people in government who can be honest brokers, honest intellectual brokers, who can tell him all the bad news and who can keep reminding him that it's not going to be as easy as sometimes he makes it sound as it's going to be. In fact, in this particular regard, there's a very important point you make. You say the idea of no effect manufacturing that has no deleterious impact on the environment is terrific. But how do you explain the fact that the Ministry of Environment seems to be gutting what meager environmental protections we have? Yeah. Clearly, this is a contradiction Mr. Modi needs to very quickly address. No, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, they've, they've, they've talked a lot about cleaning the Ganga, but the fact of the matter is we have no roadmap for a credible environmental regime in the Ministry of Environment that can promise that at the end of five years our air will be cleaner, our water will be less poisoned, and our natural environment more protected. And I think this is also going to be important for them economically, not just for the environment, because if you recall, what derailed the last government? 
the fact that most of their projects got stuck at the level of the Supreme Court or the National Green Tribunal. Over issues like this? Over issues like this. And they have to go to these institutions with a credible face. They're still trying too many shortcuts. Uh, and, and I think that is where, you know, the long run is catching up with us on these issues and I think they need to reckon with that. You're pointing out how in fact if they don't think right. these issues through properly they could get tripped up at the Supreme Court level. Right. Is there another danger? That the push to increase manufacturing because it provides jobs and because it fulfills Mr. Modi's right. promise may actually lead to shortcuts in terms of environmental protection that actually result in environmental degradation. Is there a real danger that could happen? This, it's, it's already very evident. Frankly, all the, uh, all the uh, uh, regulations that the Ministry of Environment has relaxed uh, in, in areas ranging from forest areas to border areas suggest that environmental degradation is the real danger. And by the way, Gujarat is not a poster child for environmental protection. I mean, Mr. Modi did things, many things remarkably well there, but not environmental protection. You mentioned Gujarat and you say it's not a poster case for environmental protection. Is there a danger that these are issues Mr. Modi doesn't take seriously or at least doesn't give priority to? I think it's not just Mr. Modi. I, don't, I think the political class as a whole doesn't quite understand that the environment is an irretrievable thing. They think somehow they can correct for it at some point later, but once the water is poisoned, it's hard to take the poison back out. So they have to really reset their right. thinking. Exactly. From, reset, from thinking. Re, re, reset thinking from first principles. Very briefly, because time is, as always, is our enemy, I want to come to one of the three schemes that Mr. Modi announced right. in his speech. I'm talking in particular about the Sansas right. Adarsh Gram Yojana, where each MP is required to adopt a village and make it a model development. And Mr. Modi has said that, in fact, the blueprint will be announced on the 11th of October, which is now less than two months away. In your eyes, is this a clever idea or is it a bit of a gimmick? Well, it is a bit of a gimmick and, and represents institutional confusion because one of the things we don't want to do is have legislators and members of parliament more involved in executive action of any kind. Uh, uh, that institutional confusion about the separation of powers is again something that bedevils the UPA government and it's a time to reset rather than exacerbate that confusion. And here, by the way, what Mr. Modi is doing is giving them a clear executive role and suddenly that separation between legislature and executive is getting blurred because MPs are now playing an executive function in his scheme. I, 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 absolutely, and his promise was to reset those institutions on first principles. So he needs to think through this the architecture of this very carefully. Two quick questions on that. Right. In giving MPs this role, even if it's a role they shouldn't have, right. is Mr. Modi overestimating their caliber? Is he assuming that individual MPs are capable of a leadership that he requires, which they may not have? Well, I mean, you know, you, you, that argument you could turn and said, you could say that what he's doing is given them goals he can hold them accountable for. Uh, so to that extent, it's, it's, it's actually not, not, you know, not a bad idea, but it's longer-term institutional consequences are something to worry Is about. Is Modi, Mr. Modi also making a second mistake? Does this scheme overlook the fact that all research shows that, in fact, Indian villagers want to move from the village to cities? Mm -hmm. Mr. Modi is actually trying to find a way of making it attractive for them not to do that. Instead of advancing urbanization, he seems to have the concept that perhaps suggests there's a certain glory and glamour in village life. I won't go there far. I mean, to be fair to the government, I think their main narrative has actually been on greater urbanization. Um, uh, but the fact of the matter is, even with uh, increasing urbanization, uh, rural India will remain a significant part of the population. And some signal that you can actually provide services in rural India may not itself be a harbinger of the fact that this government doesn't like urbanization. If anything, frankly, the balance uh, of their policies are very much in the other direction. My last question, Mr. Modi would have been in office for three months on the 26th of this month. That's literally just about a week away. What's your verdict on the first three months? Uh, I think there's still reason for hope. But I think concern is mounting that they're not seizing this historic op opportunity with the kind of clarity and imagination that many people had hoped. The interesting thing is the way you ended it. Concern is mounting right. that they're letting opportunities right. slip. Right. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, it, well, con you know, partly because as time goes by, your political legitimacy decreases, but also because uh, you settle into very familiar ways of doing things. And I think the first 100 days ban, which had been promised, I don't think we see evidence of that as yet. So Mr. Modi needs to act fast, otherwise it could be too late. He needs to act fast and he also needs to reflect on, as you said, the, the, the sins of omission and the mistakes they've already made. Pratap Bhanu Mehta, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much.